And good morning and uh, good afternoon, depends on which part of the world you are sitting right now. Um, you are in this webinar uh, on inclusive social protection for migrant refugees and asylum seekers. Is it a myth or reality? Um, my name is Peter Ragno, I'm the Chief of Social Policy here at um, UNICEF uh, um, in Egypt. And this seminar, uh, this webinar is really based about, uh, on a, on a on a recent study um, and report that uh, the IPC in Brazil and UNICEF have been working on for the past few months to try and really answer this question. It is, uh, can social protection, can national social protection system uh, be inclusive of non-national, so non-migrants? Now, the discussion today um, will have, um, um, as uh, it is not only, it's not about Egypt, it's not only about the region or the Middle East, but it's really uh, as the benefit to, to contribute to the global discussion, the, clo the, the answer that many countries are trying to find to, to this question. Now, um, the, the studies have already been uh, uh, published online. The, the studies are on the IPC website, all the links will be shared. Uh, later on, and we are in the process of finalizing also a report highlights just to um, the, the summarize the key uh, enablers that we have identified through these um, through these um, uh, studies to, to this assessment that we've done. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody that's uh, uh, in the panel. Let me start by um, thanking the Honorable Mis uh, Minister uh, Nevin El Kabash uh, and her team uh, that have been helping us in uh, setting this up. The IPC team, um, Rafael, Marina, Maya, and Lucas, uh, Mirita and Ovain from the World Bank, Samam, the regional advisor for um, the Middle East of, for UNICEF, colleagues from UNICEF, uh, Lina sitting at a distance from me, but she's been the brain behind this webinar as well. Uh, all the attendees, but also some uh, partnerships that are um, funding these initiatives, not just in Egypt, but also globally, like our colleagues from the Prospects Partnership with the government um, of the Netherlands and colleagues from the socialprotection.org. Um, let me um, start with uh, giving uh, uh, the words to Dr. Nevin for some brief opening remarks. And, and then followed by uh, Rafael. A brief introduction about Dr. Nivin. I mean, she's now uh, Minister of um, Social Solidarity here in Egypt, but she's much more than that. Um, she has been working for several years um, with uh, government agencies here in Egypt and also internationally. She's a former uh, UNICEF staff. I always highlight that because that uh, highlights how uh, the shared values that, that we have. And she has been a, an advisor to the Minister of Social Solidarity from 2015, Deputy Minister of Social Solidarity, and then from 2018, Minister of Social Solidarity. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nivin, for some uh, opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. And it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much, Pierre Vici, for uh, inviting me to this important event. And it's a great pleasure to be with uh, distinguished speakers, Raphael, uh, uh, Marina, Saman, and Vitika. And actually, uh, what you said about me is uh, the most important of which is that uh, I was serving at UNICEF, and this is a, a very precious period uh, in my life where I carry its message into my heart. Actually, the issue of migrants is very important. The issue is becoming even more and more important with the increasing numbers of refugees and migrants in Egypt. And um, it's a long history of, of migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, we have no policy of encampment and asylum seekers. Uh, asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants are free to choose their place of residence. Uh, and actually, there's an estimate of 5 million migrants, refugees in Egypt, around uh, 250,000 refugees uh, and asylum seekers registered with UNHCR uh, from 58 nationalities. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, there is a big number uh, which is uh, not registered and informal, and that's why we are uh, investing all of our efforts to, the, to develop a roadmap and to have a database as accurate as possible. Uh, the issue of asylum seekers is, is not only social protection for us, but it's human rights. And Egypt actually signed the international conventions to have itself committed with uh, fulfilling the rights of uh, 
of refugees, uh, special attention is given definitely as all of us uh, doing in these uh, emergencies with children and women and actually around uh, 3,836 uh, are unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied and separated children uh, and uh, uh, countries sending the largest numbers of refugees uh, and migrants to Egypt are uh, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, uh, the, uh, but the biggest of which Somalia as well, as, uh, as well. but the biggest uh, actually large numbers of uh, are coming from Syria, especially after the Arab Spring. And uh, um, it is difficult to determine the extent uh, uh, of illegal immigration due to the informality of the phenomenon um, and the status of illegal migrants. Uh, so after the Arab Spring, there was an increase in irregular, increase in irregular uh, movement of children uh, from the Middle East to Europe in the Mediterranean. Um, so recently uh, we are in coordination with different agencies uh, like IOM, UNICEF, uh, uh, many international organizations uh, where we are developing a, a whole strategy and this would be our first strategy in order to have a vision where we want to go, uh, how we have, and actually the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is also with us uh, and uh, the National Council for Human Rights. Um, I think um, what we're aiming to do during the coming period is to have this strategy developed with uh, uh, as, as, as much as, as accurate database. Anyway, um, let us see the presentation. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And then we will reflect together about the presentation. I, I read it, I was very happy to get informed, more informed with the precious information. So thank you very much and wish you a wonderful presentation, John. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Vien. Thank you for highlighting the, the rights. I mean, I think it's uh, very clear that, that that's the way forward to think about this issue. It's, it's about human rights. Uh, um, okay, good. Um, Rafael. So Rafael, uh, uh, Rafael Osorio, many of us uh, uh, know him. He's a research coordinator of um, IPC in Brazil. And uh, special thanks because I know that 6 a.m. in Brazil um, and he's joining um, from there together with, uh, with, with his colleagues. Um, he has been um, um, working um, in the IPC and the IPEA. Um, for quite a few years. He has been also working with the Brazilian government um, as an advisor. And he has been working also with many countries across the world, including Egypt. Um, he, he has been a part of the team that also supported. There is a very strong connection between Egypt and Brazil uh, in relation to social protection and beyond. And I think the IPC team, Rafael and his colleagues have also have been the one that have uh, contributed to establish this, this big uh, connection between between these uh, uh, two countries. So uh, over to you, Rafael, for some uh, quick remarks. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, Peter, for the nice words. Uh, as Peter said, it has been a long partnership. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today with you in the seminar to share uh, some more knowledge that was produced. Uh, uh, in this partnership between UNICEF and, and, and IPC. Uh, I'm also very pleased to meet again Nivin today. Uh, now the Honorable Minister Nivin, last time we met, you were still Dr. Nivin in charge of Takapo and Karama, being the driving force of the program, and now you're in charge of the whole social protection of the country. I think Egypt is very uh, well served in this regard. So uh, for the for the subject, today's subject is a very important subject, as, as, as Peter and, and Nivini already mentioned. Uh, we're going to be sharing this, this study that was made by IPC researchers, uh, uh, Marina, Lucas, and Maya. Congratulations to them. We are eager to see the results that we are going to present today. I know that today we're also going to have some colleagues from the World Bank uh, uh, sharing their knowledge, their study on the situation of the migrants from, from Venezuela to Brazil uh, is also a very important issue that is connected. So, but the question here, what we want to discuss really today is this issue, the, the subject. Uh, do migrants, refugees, and island seekers, do they have access to social protection? Uh, I like the name of the, of the, 
of the, the seminar. Is this a myth or reality? Okay, because we know that these people are very vulnerable. Okay. They lack the community ties that provide social protection. They come with their families to other to other countries uh, that they don't know. Sometimes they don't speak the language. They don't know where to seek for help. So how does the social protection system of the countries include or exclude these people that really need social protection? So this is a very important issue that we're going to be discussing today. In Brazil, is a very pressing issue, not only because of the people from Venezuela that come to Brazil, but also from Bolivia and also Latin American countries. Given the current situation, it might be that sometime in the future, Brazilians will be migrants in other countries. This is happening because we are starting to flee Brazil because of the situation. Migrants go working for better, better economic situation, for better process for their families, and they seek the countries that can offer that. And how these countries receive these migrants. So uh, uh, in our partnership with the Middle East and North Africa Regional Office, of UNICEF, uh, we also learned that this is also a very important issue in many other countries of the region. I hope that this will be a fruitful discussion, so I, I wish a nice webinar for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thanks. Um, so just a, a few words about the flow of the webinar before uh, giving the word to the colleagues, uh, the IPC for presenting uh, basically this, this studies that uh, um, it was just completed. Um, we, we're going to start with a presentation from the IPC team. We're going to be followed by the presentation from our colleague um, at the World Bank, as uh, Rafael was saying, which is a specific focus on Brazil uh, and uh, Brazil and Venezuelan uh, migrants. Then we're going to have some reflection from Dr. Nivin, from the minister, and uh, uh, some um, the regional advisor. Um, for UNICEF and social policy. Then there's going to be some round of questions that we already received for um, some of the panelists, and then we open the floor. Uh, at the end, uh, uh, please do use the um, uh, question and answer um, uh, option in, in the webinar. We'll try to moderate the question as, as much as possible. We'll try to, to raise the question that, that you are uh, typing in. Please be specific on who would you would like to ask the question. So we'll try to direct uh, the question to the right panelists. Okay, so um, let me start. Um, so now we're gonna have the presentation from the IPC team. Uh, there's gonna be Marina, uh, Maya and Lucas. They are all researchers of the IPC, but they, they, uh, they have much more than uh, the, as a background, the IPC, they've been working also with UN agencies in, in the past with the, uh, Marina, for instance, been working with the ILO regional office uh, in, uh, in Asia and the ILO decent uh, work team in East and South Asia. Um, Maya, she's um, also a researcher of the IPC, executive, a, a quite a lot of experience um, in the MENA region specifically on Jordan and also on uh, Palestinian refugees. And Lucas um, also uh, recently joined the uh, IPC, but has been working on social protection and forced migration uh, in Latin America, as well as uh, in the uh, MENA region, working with other UN agencies in partnership with other UN agencies, including uh, UNICEF and uh, FAO. Um, now, if uh, you are ready, um, you can start your presentation. I'm going to turn off my camera. Uh, you have about 20 minutes. Um, over to you, Marina. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Peter. It's also a pleasure for me to be here today with um, this, these uh, uh, audience and panelists. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Marina Andragi, and I, um, I and Lucas will be presenting the IPCIG research report on improving social protection for international migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in Egypt, an overview of international practices. Uh, I apologize in advance for the quick presentation and also for speaking a bit fast, if I do. So if anyone wants to uh, know more about a section or a slide, so please let me know. Uh, please write to us after the presentation. Um, at the, this is the outline of the presentation. Um, if we first go over the objectives of the report and, and uh, introduce the conceptual framework, and then 
Part two is on the overview of international practices and inclusion of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers uh, in national social protection systems in other countries. Part three is the case study of Egypt, where we provide an overview of uh, and potential gaps of the national legal framework and international obligations assumed by Egypt in protection of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. And part four uh, is a summary of the protection and cross-cutting recommendations that we made in the report. So uh, this report it analyzes uh, noteworthy practices adopted by countries to expand the access to social protection for migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, um, aiming to use international experiences to inform the policy debate on extending social protection to these groups in Egypt. Now, while a vast literature is dedicated to understanding the fundamental role of Egypt as the top migrant sending country in MENA, less attention has been directed at, as, at its, its position as host and transit country. And over the last two decades, the number of displaced persons living in the country has increased by more than 18 times. Um, so this is kind of the, the background to the report, a sort of an, an introduction. Um, the objectives of the report, they are summarizing these three questions that you see in the screen, the screen. So the first one is to what extent do national social protection systems have the capacity to integrate migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers? The second is to uh, how are other countries ensuring the right to social protection for all, especially the most vulnerable? And the third is what is the potential to extend social protection to migrants in MENA with a focus on Egypt? And uh, whenever the report does not provide full and exact answer to those questions, it aims to provide broad reflections around them. So please uh, be aware of that. Uh, for the conceptual framework, of the report, um, it, aim, it, it um, generally aims to answer the second question that I just mentioned. And we included a set, a set of concepts and definitions that frame the review of migrants' access to social protection. So one of the central conceptual debates included was the key role of social protection for all, where we defined social protection as a tool to increase the resilience of families in situation of poverty or vulnerability. And then we discussed the human rights-based approach on social protection the idea that social protection must be progressively guaranteed as a right um, to all, according to the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other important guiding instruments. Then we also discussed the sharp response of social protection given the, co the context in MENA and the occurrence of migratory crisis and also due to the COVID-19 crisis more recently. And um, uh, I'll give the floor now to my colleague Lucas who will present section two of the presentation and then I'll come back again uh, for sections uh, three and four. Thanks very much. Thank you, Marina, and thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, and I will briefly present some highlights of the country cases that were explored in our research report, aiming to answer the second question of this presentation, how are countries ensuring the right to social, uh, to social protection for international migrants? Uh, especially the most vulnerable. And I will focus on some enabling factors in each country case, but it's uh, important to keep in mind that all the cases presented here also have their limitations. And to know more about them, you can always check the full report and send your questions. Uh, so uh, for social assistance, we analyzed three countries, uh, Morocco, Turkey, and Brazil. Uh, and Morocco has been adapted uh, its migratory policies towards a humanitarian approach. Uh, and there is evidence showing that around 2.5 thousand nationals were receiving social assistance between 2017 and 2018. And this access is the result uh, of factors such as changes in the legislative frameworks, including a new constitution based on more egalitarian principles between nationals and non-nationals. Uh, the adoption of a new migration policy that represented a paradigmatic shifting, replacing a policy based uh, uh, on a security approach that used to criminalize uh, irregular migration, and the adoption of a comprehensive strategy that structured objectives, a logical framework, and a governance strategy to immigration in the country. And the next, the next case explored was Turkey. Uh, where political and economic interest favored cooperation between the European Union and the government of Turkey. For sure, there are several criticisms on this cooperation, but on the social protection side, 
the European Union has been uh, financing the expansion of social protection for refugees and asylum seekers. And the emergency social safety net, for example, is an unconditional cash transfer and the largest humanitarian intervention financed by the European Union. Uh, it's interesting to note that the program is aligned with the national uh, social protection system in Turkey, as it runs through the pre-existing social assistance office in close cooperation between international agencies and the Ministry of Family and Social Policy. And one of the advantages of working through the existing system was the capacity to rapidly reach beneficiaries. Uh, by the end of the first year of implementation of this program, a total of 1 million individuals were uh, already enrolled. Uh, well, for the case of Brazil, uh, uh, it, the case of Brazil will be further explored by our World Bank colleagues, but I'd like just to highlight that over 10,000 Venezuelan migrants benefited from the main conditional cash transfer in the country, the Bolsa Familia program. And along with other reasons, this uh, was possible because Brazil comes with a comprehensive legal framework, including directives uh, clarifying the, the rights of non-nationals to enroll in the single registry of social programs. Uh, regarding social insurance, our report dedicates a special subsection to debate the role of social security agreements. And the case study of the Philippines illustrate how countries of a region can take unilateral initiatives to protect their workers overseas, such as Egypt in the MENA region. Uh, the Philippines is a top migrant sending country in Southeastern Asia and thousands of Filipino migrant workers and their families can access social insurance benefits because the country counted with the early development of governance structures for labor migration, establishing a public agency to facilitate employment overseas and protect workers. And since 1995, uh, uh, law provisions guarantee that agency hired migrants uh, must be covered by a, mand a mandatory insurance scheme made available by a special welfare fund. And also migrant workers, not agency hired, can contribute to the welfare fund on a voluntary basis. Moreover, the national uh, social uh, security system comes with user-friendly services channels for migrants, offices in the main host countries, and actively pursues bi bilateral social security agreements as a tool to provide equal treatment for migrant workers and ensure uh, the portability of benefits. To illustrate uh, the case of inclusion on labor market policies, we observed the case of Denmark and Colombia. And in Colombia, Venezuela migrants can access the services provided by the public employment service, including, for example, orientation for interviews and workshops to close gaps in the job seeker formation. And both regular and irregular Venezuela migrants can benefit from these services. Uh, and the agencies uh, are free and available in all the national territory. And another relevant initiative to address the issue of the high number of undocumented migrants and high uh, employment informality among Venezuelans consisted on the creation of a special visa that allows employers who intend to hire an undocumented Venezuelan migrant to request a special permit on the Ministry of Labor website, allowing the regularization of the migratory status and the entrance in the formal labor market. Well, and in Denmark, um, it's a noteworthy case because the number of refugees uh, employed more than doubled in only three years. Uh, and it was possible because the country considers employment uh, as the main path to the social integration of non-nationals, making labor market participation the central issue to integrate refugees. And in 2015, a new strategy to promote labor integration was adopted and included the creation of the integrative training program, which combines employment, structured training and education, improved methods of screening asylum seekers qualifications, assessing both formal and informal qualifications. And uh, it's important to notice that 
uh, how local uh, governments have importance in this strategy, because the municipalities are responsible uh, to assess the requirements in the local labor market, and then build specific training to qualify refugees and migrants for job opportunities. Uh, well, regarding the provision of basic services, the case of Lebanon is an example of good practice as the number of refugees assessing education quadrupled in five years. Uh, one enabling factor was the collaboration with international institutions to implement the reaching out children with education strategies, which established subsidies for enrollment fees, regulated non-formal education opportunities, and opened a second shift in public schools, uh, enlarging the availability of vacancies for non-nationals. And regarding the provision of healthcare, refugees are covered in Iran on the same basis as nationals. And enabling factors include uh, the existence of a universal healthcare system and the strong international cooperation for the inclusion of non-nationals. UNHCR, for example, covers uh, the cost of premiums for uh, vulnerable refugees. Uh, finally, our, reports, uh, our, report, our report provides a summary of uh, enabling factors identified in the analyzed cases for legislation and policy. It includes, for example, the progressive change towards more inclusive legislation and policies based on human rights principles and non-discrimination. For international cooperation, we highlighted the importance of aligning the efforts of humanitarian and governmental initiatives. For migration governance, it's important to organize structures according to strategic objectives and coordinating with local instances of government. And on social protection implementation, it's important to strengthen the provision of adequate services, including the availability of information in other languages, as is both formal and informal qualifications of migrants, asylum seekers and refugees, among many others that you can check on in, in box four of our report using the link in the chat. And well, thank you all for the attention and back to you, Marina. Uh, thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, I'll pass on now to the case study of Egypt as host country of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, the Egyptian constitution provides the right to grant refugee status to political asylum seekers and prohibits their extradition rather than their refoulement. Refoulement uh, is a broader concept than extradition. However, the refugee definition in the constitution is more limited than under the 1951 Refugee Convention, what can mean that the country may be falling short in meeting international obligations in that regard. Neither the constitution nor other domestic laws uh, have elaborated on the procedure for granting political refugee status, and it has only been granted in can you see my screen? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, the, the political asylum has been granted in rare cases to previous heads of state and political allies before. Some other indications of gaps in legal coverage of migrants in social protection in Egypt is that rights to social security and health insurance are guaranteed are guaranteed to all, but without explicit mention to migrants. Same applies to the protection of all granted to all workers. Uh, it does not explicitly mention migrants in the constitution. And the fact that the, the constitution explicitly provides citizens uh, uh, the protection against discrimination in many fronts, for example. Uh, the national strategy against irregular migration, uh, another relevant legal framework, is a step taken by the government of Egypt to address the issues with irregular migration, uh, but focuses particularly on preventing illegal or irregular immigration by Egyptians, which is also particularly important since unaccompanied Egyptian children constitute a high share of Egyptians abroad. Um, law number 82 of 2016 on combating illegal migration and smuggling migrants, um, it uh, exempts migrants from any criminal or civil liability and imposes penalties on smugglers. And it also appointed the National Council for Childhood and Motherhood as the legal guardian for all unaccompanied children in Egypt. Uh, however, this legal framework on smuggled migrants disregards the rights to seek asylum, freedom of movement, social protection, education, and protection against refoulement for the migrants. 
They also do not provide a time frame for administrative detention or provide specifics on the, on the treatment of migrants prior to deportation. And uh, regarding the international instruments of providing rights to international migrants, Egypt has ratified many of them, uh, including the one cited in the slide, in the slide here. Uh, moving on to what can be accessed by Egypt's uh, by migrants by migrants in Egypt in terms of social insurance and labor market interventions. We note that 48% of refugees and asylum seekers in Egypt are of working age, so almost half. And uh, according to law number 12 of 2003, the validity of paid domestic work uh, as an employment relationship is denied in, in Egypt, which can hinder um, access of migrant domestic workers to social protection. But the law also says that uh, migrant workers in the formal sector, in formal employment, are protected against discrimination in salaries and also against termination of contracts based on discrimination. Um, law 159 of 1981 further limits um, the migrant workforce allowed in registered companies and in certain sectors of employment in Egypt. Uh, law 213 of 2017 guarantees the right to foreign workers to join trade unions. And according to ministerial decision number 160 from 2019, uh, foreign workers may only work in Egypt if they have a work permit. And um, the issue is that the latest uh, decisions have been less and less clear about um, previous exemptions to the work permit that were the, the, to the work permit requirement and cost to Palestinian refugees and stateless individuals, for example. But this latest decision says that the exemptions apply only to countries that have a reciprocity agreement with Egypt, with uh, do not include some of the main origin countries of migrants in Egypt. Um, still according to this ministerial decision, uh, HIV tests are no longer required to attain a work permit, for example. And the law allows migrant, migrants without a work permit to have one issued retroactively however, with a relatively high cost for the migrant. Uh, further regarding social insurance and labor market, Egypt has contributory social insurance and health insurance schemes, but effective coverage is limited. Law 79 of 1975 says that only nationals of countries with a reciprocity agreement may benefit from social insurance and for work-related injury insurance, even if workers are not covered by a reciprocity agreement, the employers still must pay the contributions. So this is the law from 1975, but there has been a, re a more recent law, number 148, which uh, extends social insurance to all foreign nationals uh, with informal employment in Egypt, as opposed to only those covered by um, reciprocity agreements. However, this law entered into force only on January 2020, and until the, the publication of the executive regulations under this law, the, the older regulations still apply. Uh, for social assistance, um, the main social assistance programs, Takaful and Karama in Egypt, that together target um, families with children and elderly persons, persons with disabilities and orphans, they do not explicitly explicitly exclude migrants in their eligibility criteria, but the application process requ requires the submission of national identity documents, for example. Uh, the social security assistance, which is based on, uh, on the law on social security number 137 of 2010, uh, it is a cash assistance program that can be paid either monthly or um, on a one-off basis to the poor and vulnerable population in Egypt, with a few exceptions. And it is also applicable to foreigners based on reciprocity agreements with Egypt or to friendly countries. Um, I'm sorry. Um, and based on, it, on our research, we noted that the main way through which poor and vulnerable uh, migrants can be reached by social, social assistance in Egypt is through the zakat giving institutions, um, given that sometimes migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers fall under the categories of uh, stranded traveler, poor, needy within the zakat stipulations. And finally, uh, we saw that in our report, we, we noted that uh, reports on the increased vulnerability of migrant workers and refugees following the COVID-19 related containment measures. Um, 
indicates that the uh, access of migrants to existing or emerging social assistance programs is limited. And now onto the recommendations. This is my final slide. Um, for the recommendations, we prepared three sections containing general recommendations, recommendations for social assistance, and recommendations for social insurance and labor market policies. These are based on the over overview of practices that Lucas presented um, in the case study of Egypt and also on further evidence and guidance found, found in, the, in the literature. Well, the first one is on building consensus on inclusive social protection through a business case, demonstrating the benefits of expanding support to migrants. So uh, preparing a business case for inclusive social protection can demonstrate the economic affordability, long-term fiscal sustainability, and rates of return of, in, of investment in extension of social protection policies, including to refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, we also talk about effective, uh, the importance of effective coordination and partnership between development partners and government responses for better alignment and more effective targeting of social protection. Uh, these partnerships have the potential to contribute to enhance the administrative, technical, and operational capacity of national social protection systems while functioning amid emergency situations, benefiting mo uh, both the host country and the migrants. Third, uh, F government efforts should, should be directed towards inclu ensuring inclusive social protections for all for all children and families residing in Egypt. So we say that pro progressively reforming its social protection policy towards a rights-based mod model capable of ensuring the principle of non-discrimination against or origin or nationality in the relevant legal instruments are essential since inclusive policy frameworks can only emerge from inclusive legislation. We also note that human rights violations tend to disproportionately affect migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers when the law does not explicitly protect them and their rights cannot be objectively enforced. Uh, fourth, we say uh, that uh, governments should grant, uh, the government of Egypt should grant legal residency and identification documents for migrants in irregular situation in the country because uh, the legal permits uh, that allow migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers to access basic services and work in the country are uh, essential for them to be able to access social protection as well. For social assistance, we uh, recommended that the preparation of feasibility studies I mean to understand how to launch social assistance programs like cash and in-kind programs that target migrants or how to improve coverage of already existing programs, existing social assistance programs to migrants, refugees and asylum seekers is important. So the social assistance programs have a great potential to address the vulnerabilities, alleviate poverty, and prevent negative coping mechanisms of migrants. And uh, we say also that in, in case of shocks or crisis, uh, when more people tend to become poor and more vulnerable, the social protective systems should be strengthened to, um, to, be, to be quicker to expand and easier to administer, benefiting all families and children in need of social assistance in the country. For social insurance and labor market, we have four uh, final recommendations. Uh, the first one is that the government can focus on eliminating barriers to access to social insurance and the formal labor market to migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, as because we've seen that formal employment can be an opportunity to protect them from the risk of different types of abuse and exploitation, for example. We also recommend the promotion of voluntary contribution schemes for migrant workers, even if in in the informal sector as a way to extend social protection coverage to migrant workers in Egypt. But we also highlight that these voluntary schemes must offer positive incentives to contribute and attractive features for informal workers and non-nationals. And they should remove informational barriers. So for example, through financial literacy programs and communication campaigns. And they should also guarantee viable conditions for the most vulnerable workers to contribute. Uh, nine is on uh, the labor market programs, uh, is that the labor market programs design should include the most vulnerable workers, and they should also include uh, skills upgrading courses, for example. And finally, uh, on the importance of gender sensitive policies, uh, we noted that only 33% of women refugees and asylum seekers are economically active in Egypt. So by guaranteeing access to services, uh, Egypt could migrate the burden of family responsibilities on women, which would affect the number of economic, economically active individuals in Egypt. Uh, so this was it. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry 
for going over the time a little bit over. Thanks, thanks, Marina. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, perfectly timed, I have to say. Um, so, just a couple, of, a couple of remarks. I mean, this is just a taste of, uh, of the report. Again, it's a very detailed uh, uh, report that goes uh, pretty deep into the case studies to really try to capture what are the uh, was the political economy, the enabling uh, factors that allowed um, certain uh, national programs. Um, to, to expand to non um, to non national. So please do spend some time to to uh, to, to read this report, the cases that you are more interested in. in. Um, uh, keep in mind also that the report we try to have a pretty comprehensive meaning uh, uh, cover the three main areas of social protection, being social assistance, social insurance, and um, uh, and labor uh, active labor market to, to give. Uh, uh, an idea of many entry points. Um, the extension of a system um, cannot happen along the three components at the same time, but it will probably happen starting from one of these um, uh, three entry points or from a fourth area, which was, was what Luca was presenting in his last slide in terms of basic services. Uh, there are several countries, including Egypt, where um, health and education system have been already uh, open to non-nationals. So maybe that's that's how uh, over time um, Egypt or other um, countries in the region can start becoming more inclusive in relation to non-nationals. Non Another interesting point was, uh, uh, and it's common across all the cases, is the le legislation, the laws that really uh, provided the, the, the framework for, for this uh, to happen and also donors, uh, development partners. Um, if you look at the Turkey case, uh, European Union was, was a key player to support the government. Same in Morocco. Um, I think in Morocco, there was also the government of Denmark. And um, so they do play a role into these uh, opening up and, and, and it, it makes sense for low and middle income countries as well, an important role of, uh, um, of development partners. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think a final point is just keep in mind that this is not a systematic review of all cases uh, globally. Uh, we handpicked cases that we felt were very relevant to uh, answer the question: Is it the myth of a reality? And when, when I when I think about what the answer is, we can it, it does happen. I mean, it's it's a reality. So we can see there are countries where. Um, that are opening up the system, but still there are some caveats, like the scale. Uh, Morocco uh, is relatively small as a scale uh, in comparison to Turkey. So the, the, the answer for me is pretty clear. It's a reality, uh, it's happening, uh, but there are some caveats that we need to, to work on. Um, so before passing the floor to our World Bank colleagues, uh, I think uh, um, let me quickly introduce the, the speaker. Um, Dr. Nritika, she's a lecturer at the um, Dalois University in Canada. She's also a fellow in forced displacement with, uh, um, with the World Bank. And um, she has been working with several agencies, including UNHCR, um, to, um, uh, on social protection for this planet. Specifically, this study focuses on integration of Venezuelan refugees and migrants in, in Brazil. And she has been working, uh, she works closely with uh, Ovain, um, social protection specialist of the World Bank um, in, uh, in Brazil. So if uh, you are ready, you have uh, about 10, 15 minutes uh, to present this case. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, we are presenting a joint work with World Bank colleagues and UNHCR colleagues on the integration of Venezuelan refugees and migrants in Brazil. This uh, work was financed by a joint program by UK's um, Foreign Aid, UNHCR, and World Bank Group. of migrants and refugees that some literature define integration as. 
Venezuela has been experiencing the largest displacement crisis in Latin America since 2013, with 5.6 million uh, Venezuelans leaving uh, Venezuela, with 90% taking shelter in Latin American countries. Colombia received about 1.8 million uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants, Peru received about 1 million, and Brazil received about 261,000 till October 2020. So unlike previous migration, uh, this is basically a south and to south migration that we observe for the Venezuelans. Most Latin American countries have showed openness in welcoming and granting legal status to Venezuelan migrants. However, research on Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador show that Venezuelans face challenges accessing former labor market, education, healthcare, and public benefits. Brazil is an unique case study because in Brazil, by law, or by policy, it has universal access to education, health care, social assistance benefits, irrespective of immigration status. And it is relatively easy to get work permits for the Venezuelan refugees and migrants to work. However, the problem with Brazil, or a challenge that Venezuelan migrants and refugees face, is the language. The language in Brazil being Portuguese, while most Venezuelans speak Spanish. Majority of the Venezuelans, migrants, and refugees have entered Brazil after 2017. We see an equal proportion of migrants and asylum seekers and refugees, with 145,000 arriving in Brazil as migrants and about 115 arriving as asylum seekers and refugees. Venezuelans in Brazil are also concentrated mainly in the neighboring states of Horaima where 50% of the uh, forced displaced Venezuelans live and about 19% in Amazonas. This might put a little bit of constraint on the public service. So the federal government of Brazil with UNHCR, so civil societies and the Catholic Church initiated the program called Operation Welcome or Acolhida, which involves three main components, border control and documentation, humanitarian assistance, including shelter, and re voluntary relocation strategies to um, states in Brazil, which has higher economic opportunities for a better socioeconomic integration. Till November 2020, about 45,000 uh, Venezuelan migrants and refugees have benefited from the relocation strategies. In the diagram, what we see is that the stock of Venezuelan migrants and refugees was increasing dramatically in 2019. However, it come to a stop for the COVID-19 pandemic. And after that, the stock remained almost constant. Looking into the characteristics of Venezuelan refugees and migrants, what we observe is that there are equal proportion of men and female. 20% are children, 70% are working age population, and 72% of Venezuelan migrants and 84% of asylum seekers above the age of 25 are singles, suggesting that there are a lot of family migration, but there is also many single parents households. Looking into the available data, what we also see is that at the time of registering in Brazil, 16% worked in households as governors, butlers, and cooks, 10% work as vendors, 5% as teachers, 3% as engineers, and 3% as administrators, suggesting that the skills are about mid-skilled. COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted the vulnerables and the Venezuelans were no different. We see that just before the pandemic, there were about 3000 Venezuelans who were voluntarily relocated by the program. However, right after the COVID-19 pandemic, about 1000 
beneficiaries are being relocated monthly now. In response to COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Brazil expanded the um, beneficiaries of the Bolsa Familia, which is the flagship conditional cash transfer in Brazil for households living in poverty and extreme poverty. And we see that there is a dramatic increase from about 18,000 individuals receiving Bolsa Familia to about 48,000 uh, beneficiaries of Bolsa Familia right after the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Social security to all is a constitutional obligation in Brazil. It has about two main components, one which is social welfare and pension, which is contributory, and then social assistance and uh, health, which is non-contributory. In this paper, we mainly focus on social assistance program and the social assistance program is uh, based on a database which is called Cadastro Unico, which is the social registry for low income families and vulnerable people. The two main flagship programs of social assistance is Bolsa Familia, which as I described is a conditional cash transfer for poor and extremely poor families and BPC, which is the continuous provision of benefits for the, which is a, basically a social pension for elderly who are above 65 years and the disabled with low income families. And in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government also introduced the auxilia emergential, which is a temporary emergential cash transfer to those whose work was being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This paper basically seeks to answer two questions, whether Venezuelan refugees and migrants face differential access to education, formal labor market, and social assistance program, mainly Bolsa Familia. We do not concentrate on health because we do not have individual level data. And then we also try to explore what are some of the observed characteristics of Venezuelan and the Brazilian environment that can be associated with the extent of integration that we observe. The data we use in order to measure integration, we need to have or compare Venezuelans with, with another group and we use the native Brazilians. Since this administrative data does not differentiate between migrants and asylum seekers, we identify the displaced Venezuelans by their country of birth. The literature uses the relative probability index to measure integration. The, and we begin our study by using the relative probability of Venezuelans as our measure for integration. The relative probability index has an easy interpretation and relative probability index of 0 0.5 means that Venezuelans are half as likely as Brazilian to be found in the sector. So we calculate the relative probability of Venezuelans to be in school by calculating the number of Venezuelans who are aged between four and 17 years, which is the mandatory school age in Brazil, enrolled in a regular school compared to the Brazilian cohort. Similarly, for the formal labor market, this paper calculates the relative probability of Venezuelans aged between 15 and 64 years old employed in the formal labor market and compare that with the Brazilian cohort. This paper also calculate the relative probability of Venezuelan regist who registers in Cadastro Unico compared to the Brazilian cohort and the probability of Venezuelans receiving Bolsa Familia given that they have registered in Cadastro Unico compared to the Brazilian counterparts. Here, it's, it, I should note that Cadastro Unico is a voluntary registration where low income family can voluntarily register in the database. 
the literature points out that this relative probability index is sensitive to outliers since it does not have an upper bound. So the literature suggested using an F index. This is basically a monotonic transformation of the relative probability index. The interpretation is that if F is zero, then it means that there is no integration. as likely to be found in the sector as Brazilian and a value of F more than 50 means that it's more likely for Venezuelans to be present than Brazilians. Looking into their access to social protection programs, what we find is that Venezuelans are less likely to be registering for Cadastro Unico. However, once they do register, they are more likely or equally likely to receive the Bolsa Familia benefits. The rate of registration or integration in Cadastro Unico has increased index is was about 18, while in 2020, the F index is about 42, which can be translated into that in 2020, Venezuelans were about 0.7, Ten times as likely to be present in Cadastro Unico as Brazilian. One thing to note here is that the extent of integration varies across states, but however, integration is lowest in Horaima, which has the highest concentration of Venezuelans living. Income is one of the main eligibility criteria and looking into the income distribution of those who are registered in Cadastro Unico, we see that Venezuelans who are registered are considerably more poorer. For example, 73% of Venezuelans have an income which is less than is 89, while only 48% of Brazilians have an average income which is lower than HEA is 89. Looking into the PBF or the Bolsa Familia beneficiaries, we see that the income for Venezuelans is lower. However, the difference is a lot less stark now with about 85% of Venezuelan Bolsa Familia beneficiaries receiving an income of less than 89 HEA is, while 83% of Brazilian Bolsa Familia beneficiary receive an income less than 89 HEIs, which is the extreme poverty rate in Brazil. Now, what we see before, if you haven't noticed, is that in 2019, we see a dip or a decrease in the coverage rate of Bolsa Familia for Venezuelans. And we want to, to investigate whether this coverage gap can be explained by some of the eligibility criteria. And we find that the coverage gap in 2019 remains after controlling for income, per capita, and family composition, which form the basic uh, eligibility criteria for receiving Bolsa Familia. Another thing we find, again, is that the concentration of Venezuelans, which is the number of Venezuelans over total population in a municipality, has a negative effect on the propensity of a household to receive Bolsa Familia. To explain the diagram here, the red line here shows that there is no effect on the likelihood of receiving Bolsa Familia while the points on the right shows that there are a, this is a positive effect on the likelihood of receiving Bolsa Familia and the dot to the left shows that there is a negative effect. What we see here is that being in extreme poverty and having children between zero to 17 increases household chances of receiving Bolsa Familia benefits. However, being Venezuelans has a negative effect or that Another way of interpreting is that Venezuelans are, have a lower likelihood of receiving Bolsa Familia in 2019. Looking into education, we find that Venezuelans have differential access to education. 
or face challenges in accessing education with about 45% overall gross enrollment rate. In federal uh, fundamental level, the enrollment rate for Venezuelan is about 74% compared to 100% of Brazilian, while at the in high school level, 40% of Venezuelans that are enrolled while in the about 80% of Brazilians are enrolled in high school. This data translates into the integration measures too. We find that it is about 0.4 times as likely for Venezuelans to be in school compared to their Brazilian cohort. And this is higher for fundamental level than at high school level. Venezuelans also tend to be older than Brazilians in grade one to five, suggesting that Venezuelans are more likely to be mismatched to class than Brazilians. Looking into the formal market, and if you look into the raw wage gap, what we find is that Venezuelans in the raw wage gap without controlling for any specific uh, characteristics have a higher income. However, we see that they face a steep hurdle in accessing the formal labor market. For example, the F index on average is about 23, which translates into that it is 0.3 times as likely as Venezuelans to be in the formal labor market as Brazilians. And the hurdle is steeper for females than for male. Again, what we see is that the integration is lowest in Horaima, which has the highest concentration of Venezuelans living. Uh, Mritika, can I ask you to try and wrap up in the next few minutes? Yeah, sure. So uh, what we find is that Venezuelans are also more likely to be occupationally downgraded and uh, it increases with education level. When we control for individual characteristics, we find that the, there is a insignificant wage penalty for Venezuelans um, the wage gap between the observed Venezuelan wage and their predicted wage, if they were rewarded equally for their endowments as Brazilians, and controlling for their selection to wage employment are substantial, especially at the fundamental and the high school level. So overall, our results suggest that even though uh, there is the legal constraint is scanned, this place Venezuelan is still face difficulty in assimilating in Brazil. Uh, uh, the main issues is the mismatch of age and occupational downgrading, two obvious barriers that we haven't controlled for in this uh, um, paper because of unavailability of data are language barriers and xenophobia, which can partly explain uh, the downgrading in grades and occupation that we observe in the data. Policy recommendation in involves facilitation of the process of credential and skill verific verification, strengthening the voluntary relocation process, provision of language training, uh, stronger labor market programs and job intermediation, and information assistance for documents issuance and enrollment to education, health and assist social assistance services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if I had to, to rush a bit. Um, but very good. I mean, I think the paper, as you can see the, the, to, to all the attendees, there is a link to the paper also in the chat, so you can have a look at the full paper. I think the key point here is also to highlight that how Brazil is often seen as a, and presented as an example of for social protection. And I think uh, there are extremely valid points. And also in the case of the extension of social protection to non-nationals. But then in this study, we also see that there might be some additional element that really um, have an impact on the level of integration of, in this case, of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. So uh, you mentioned xenoph xenophobia, um, you mentioned also the language. 
So the, the legislation and the opening up of, uh, of the legislation to allow not nationals in the social protection system and beyond is not enough to make sure that there is a proper integration and the non-national do, do, do benefit as much as uh, vulnerable nationals of, uh, of these kind of programs. So um, thank you very much for this uh, deep dive um, on Brazil. I think uh, next uh, we have, um, I would like to give the floor to, to the minister, Dr. Nivin. Uh, for some reflections some, uh, on, on what we heard from the colleagues at the IPC, from the colleagues uh, at the, the World Bank. I mean, this discussion, uh, obviously you are a minister of, here in Egypt, but I think as I highlighted before, you're also a practitioner uh, with experience in, in quite a few countries. So uh, feel free to, to, to uh, reflect also on uh, what you see these implications are across uh, outside of Egypt, but also obviously um, on Egypt as well. Um, if you can uh, uh, limit your um, reflection to about uh, seven, ten minutes, and uh, uh, over to you, Dr. Degan. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Degan. Yeah. Is it right? I think um, uh, there is a, a structural problem whether refugees uh, are in Egypt or in any, uh, any other country. Uh, there are structural uh, issues that we have to tackle. Um, uh, the first of which is, the, uh, is having uh, the legal documents, uh, which is per se very specific to the, uh, to the, to the context of refugees. Because I, I agree with what Marina said in, in terms of absence of some of the basic rights to the refugees in Egypt, although Egypt's uh, uh, constitution in 2014 provided protection to refugees and asylum seekers. For instance, Article 91 prohibits the extradition of political refugees. And we also have a presidential decree in 1980 adopted that adopted the refugee convention as domestic law but there is always a gap between the legal part and uh, the programmatic and the, the part that really applies to the to the refugees uh, yes we can have uh, some of the laws and some of the conventions that the countries uh, sign but in terms of having a vision in itself is uh, mostly absent um, this is number one. Number two is that some of the countries that are hosting refugees are themselves suffering from social protection issues, even regarding their own citizens, uh, and especially uh, countries especially in the MENA region, where after the Arab Spring, most of the, of the countries suffer from economic repercussions on the Egyptian issues and, the, and on the rights issues, and especially with uh, the countries being panicking out of um, uh, coming out from a challenge and a big issues, big problems that's happened in, uh, in and the flow of in, in infusion of many other nationalities. And they were, there was a, at that time structured issues regarding national security. Uh, but nonetheless, big flow of, of, uh, of refugees uh, uh, were hosted in Egypt with special emphasis on uh, Syrians who have uh, now in, not only employment rights, uh, actually they themselves employ Egyptians. So they were very successful uh, to make their own issue. The parts of informality and actually the most important part, which is uh, uh, the refugee status determination uh, uh, is a, a big issue. If you can compare the, the numbers that you, your UNHCR has and having 5 million 5 million is, is a separate country, you know, it's a big, big numbers of refugees are being hosted. So the countries sometimes host refugees more than they can swallow. And then many of the rights are not fulfilled, um, especially with whether these persons are seeking uh, access to national protection. Uh, so I know and we appreciate the, uh, the efforts that UNHCR is, is investing with Egypt to assume increased responsibility uh, to refugee status determination. And um, in general, we have, we, we are, as Marina listed, there are lots of 
rights, uh, although we have some sorts of uh, rights in education, but nonetheless, we still have problem with language, especially in areas and uh, in, in different countries in terms of health uh, insurance, they receive, uh, although they don't have health, official health insurance, but they receive health care in Egyptian hospitals. And um, um, as I said, there's a gap between the, the legal and the practice. Uh, I think also uh, uh, public schools are accessible to migrants uh, and, and refugees, especially for nationalities who, who are Arabic speakers. So it's much, it's much easier for them. Otherwise, they, you will find them in, in separate schools that they did for themselves in order to, to, to cope with the situation. Uh, I think also the, the, the second challenge is the fees because uh, the, the school fees is actually ranges from whatever the, the amount is. But in case of the asylum seekers, um, sometimes UNHCR helps them to cover their educational fees, but for the illegal migra migrants, they have problems in covering the fees. So many of the children drop out from school. And since they don't have official papers, even in their employment, they are not, they are subject towards abuse and subject towards, the, towards exploitation from the employers. Um, children without birth certificates and adults uh, uh, without valid documents are not under the mandate of the UNHCR. So as, as a result, uh, they go to private hospitals or private schools. So uh, they, they suffer from the big amount of money that is needed. And, uh, uh, and actually uh, they work mostly in informal sectors. Um, uh, they can face more violations uh, in the informal sectors. They have difficulty finding uh, housing, which is due to the fact that landowners often require residency permits, which can be obtained on, on ballot passports. They don't accept um, the UNHCR. Many of the uh, landowners, they don't accept it. So the, the situation at large, even in terms of the SIM cards and the bank accounts, uh, again, uh, they need official papers. Um, so because they don't accept uh, bank accounts without having uh, a valid uh, passport or ID. Um, I think um, the lack of, of awareness on legal assistance opportunities is a big issue. And this is what I found in the ministry uh, in terms of uh, dealing with my colleagues. Um, it is, they, they don't have the legal aspects and they, they are hardly aware of the assistance opportunities for refugees. Um, there is a misperception between refugees, the definition of refugee in itself, the difference between refugee and asylum seeker and so on. So the term itself is not clear. Um, the, we, we need to develop a comprehensive legal instrument to deal with refugees or asylum seekers. And that's why I was saying that even though if the strategy is developed, but this strategy doesn't have a strong legal framework uh, that actually protects the rights of the refugees. Um, so what we're trying to do now is that uh, uh, to develop uh, uh, a, um, a vision and legal framework with Egyptian authorities and with um, we're, we have partners with us, NCCM and Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, um we, big problem that we have, uh, uh, we lack uh, an accurate database to reflect the number of Russian migrants. Uh, estimates are very big gap. There, there is a big, very big gap between the estimates of the different agencies, uh, depending on the number of work permits and, uh, and, and data receipts. Also, there are obstacles to extending insurance uh, protection for Egyptian workers abroad, including lack of bilateral agreements. Uh, so I think the issue of it's not only in within the country, but between the countries uh, and themselves to develop a uh, uh, bilateral agreement in the field of social insurance, especially with, uh, with, with different countries, when with including Arab Gulf states. Uh, there are, we have only four agreements in the field of insurance. Uh, between Egypt, uh, Sudan, Greece, and I think um, Cyprus and Netherlands. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we need to, to, to work even between countries and themselves. Um, there's also lack of coordination efforts between government 
and international organizations and CSOs. Um, many of the uh, um, international organizations are dissatisfied with the, the um, with the effect with the effectiveness of uh, lack of effectiveness of the rights of refugees. So they work separately. They work only to to finish uh, formal and legal issues. Uh, but we need they need more to advocate for uh, the rights of refugees and also the the government and CSOs, even the CSOs, and I remember since my arrival in the in, in the ministry, and this is, I will start my eighth year, uh, I hardly found some of the CSOs and NGOs that are really serving. They are not numerous, uh, they are very limited, and they are closed amongst themselves. They work with the UNHCR. So what I, what I believe is that to develop or to extend networks and coordination between government, uh, international organizations, and CSOs uh, that are supporting social protection programs for migrants hosted in Egypt. The, um, uh, there's also an increased number of illegal migrants who do not have access to national social protection programs. And mind you that I'm responsible for having social protection programs for the poor and near to poor, and it's still not yet covered. We are covering uh, certain percentage of the people who are eligible uh, for social protection, even though the Egyptians themselves. This does not have, uh, this does not create a justification uh, to, to decrease this. Under the ministry, the Egyptian Red Crescent is working on, Egyptian Red Crescent is one of the big organizations that is supporting refugees. And uh, actually we're working with them now um, uh, there is not, they are not working alone. There is also Amera and there are other CSOs. Uh, so, and, and Egyptian Red Crescent, actually we're supporting the Egyptian Red Crescent to support refugees. So sometimes the government does not work uh, on, uh, on it directly, but it works through CSOs. Uh, the Egyptian Red Crescent is supporting uh, protection for 93,000 refugees. I claim that during the COVID-19, refugees and asylum seekers faced uh, uh, tremendous difficulties uh, in Egypt, especially with the housing conditions uh, and with the lack of uh, uh, sanitizers and so on. There's lack of automation services offered to non-nationals uh, in terms of registrations, payment and contribution. What we are speaking about, uh, we were speaking about uh, the previous two months is to develop an electronic network between the agencies that are supporting refugees or that are supposed to, uh, to, to serve refugees. Uh, also the inability to provide decent jobs. Maybe the Syrians very much succeeded because they per se themselves are skilled. So, I mean, the, the, the market is open. I mean, if, if any refugee or asylum seeker uh, um, uh, exerts or uh, have some sorts of business, I mean, the market is open. Uh, yes, they might find some of the challenges in terms of having the legal issues, but it goes with uh, refugees. The issue is that they lack also the capacities, uh, the, the skills and the language. So they are stuck with unemployment and with increasing poverty and lack of social protection. Uh, there's also lack of access to legal assistance. Uh, so whenever they have problems, uh, they, they face risks like uh, uh, conflict with the employer, like uh, violence, like disability. Uh, they really uh, lack legal assistance. Um, also, they have limited fiscal space. Uh, for, the government has limited uh, fiscal space for for social protection at large. But it actually it does not justify that uh, we need to to, to expand our uh, social protection scheme. So I end up with some of the current efforts uh, that we uh, <clears throat> plan for. Uh, to extend social protection to migrants and refugees, uh, the national law of social insurance, uh, the new one, uh, law number 149 for 2019, provide coverage to Egyptian migrants uh, against risks, including disability, aging, and health shocks, but also must is coordinating with the Ministry of Immigration and uh, Egyptian Expatriates Affairs on the reintegration of refugees into the Egyptian labor market uh, especially, this was very clear during COVID-19 crisis. So now we're working with the many with the, um, Her Excellency Ambassador Nabila in order to um, uh, to have some sort of legal framework 
uh, on the reintegration of returnees uh, um, and also on working with uh, Refu Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the refugees in Egypt. The government is also working on introducing new benefit schemes and financial products um, to enable Egyptian mig <clears throat> migrants to transfer remittances and pay contribution of social remittance through online platforms to their family origins. Uh, and um, uh, the newly issued law regulating the practice of non-governmental activities uh, and its executive regulations allow for establishing NGOs or, or CSOs uh, abroad, which enhance social integration and service uh, provision to Egyptian migrants. And the Egyptian migrants can themselves uh, form a sort of NGO uh, or um, um, an, an a CSO to, to, um, to, to, to maintain their rights. The government is working on introducing multiple interventions to reduce barriers related to uh, the reintegration of non-nationals and refugees in Egypt, which include social barriers, language barriers, and social acceptance. Um, also, the government of Egypt uh, had adopted a holistic strategy uh, to combat human trafficking, because I think human trafficking and illegal migration is an issue. Uh, so uh, there's a, uh, uh, the, yani, an attempt to adapt a holistic strategy to combat human trafficking and illegal migration based on coordinating national international efforts to undertake special measures for prevention and protection. Uh, so also MUS has established the first shelter for victims of human trafficking to address their needs uh, uh, and their different care services. Um, uh, we are currently working on different programs that provide training, uh, as well as technical assistance and life skills prior uh, uh, to migration for increased employability to ensure an efficient uh, uh, match of potential migrants uh, to employers abroad and uh, uh, to ensure that they get a decent job. I think it's a, it's a big issue that needs to have a, a clear vision uh, because the laws can be there but in terms of practice, they are very limited. I know that there are challenges regarding the refugees themselves and the situation, the economic situation in Egypt, but uh, there, and actually the coordination between the different countries uh, and the coordination between the government, international organizations and CSOs, uh, um, it, and the big numbers that Egypt is hosting, 5 million is a big challenge and unrealistic to provide them all with the, the social protection measures is not a matter of intention and, and the, 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 the intention and the good intention so how to fulfill the rights, but also the realistic measures that we have. So I think um, we need to work on a broader strategy. Uh, the, the, the intention to have them fulfilling, to, to have them covered with social protection is there. Me as a minister of social protection is really committed for that cause. And that's why I was very keen to meet IOM and UNHCR when I arrived to this job. And then COVID-19 came to, to have us all busy running everywhere. But I think uh, also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is willing to do that with us. Uh, so uh, looking forward and I appreciate uh, uh, actually the presentation on Venezuelans. Uh, I was very much impressed with the, uh, the, the, the disaggregated data that they have and the sets of social protection measures and rights that are covering in spite that there are many challenges but nonetheless they are much better in a situation that is much better than Egypt. So I think also benefiting from the other countries who are providing uh, uh, refugees and asylum seekers with set of the basic rights is very important and we look high uh, to extend and to intensify our collaboration with UNICEF to give us uh, the be their best experience in this regard and we remain committed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nimin. I think you raised a, a very interesting point, like, uh, you know, the reality it's uh, as a country, not only Egypt, the, the, uh, the poverty levels are pretty high across the region and uh, uh, governments often need to really work within a, a fixed uh, set of resources. So there is a, a bit of a competition about supporting nationals first 
and then non-national. So this is a big, big issue that I mean, clearly there is no, no answer. And also I, I get your call for all of us for as development uh, partners that uh, we need to coordinate more. I mean, it, it is true uh, that, uh, and not only in Egypt, that sometimes we run um, behind our priorities and we, 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 we don't coordinate as much as we should to offer a more of a comprehensive uh, uh, support. So I think it's a, uh, it's a it's an important call that you are making here for for, for all of us. Uh, I hope you can still stay with us because we are receiving some questions, and uh, I would like uh, to give first a uh, few minutes to to some of them and then come back to you if with some questions. Okay, thank you. So um, next. Um, Samam. Um, Samam is the regional advisor uh, for UNICEF on social policy, uh, specifically works on uh, social protection, poverty, and public finance for she children. He, he supports, uh, he oversees the work of uh, 20 uh, UNICEF uh, offices in the region. Uh, he has been uh, working in this region, but also in, um, in Asia, including some country offices, Cambodia, Viet Vietnam, and uh, Myanmar. Um, Samam, uh, over to you for um, five, seven minutes um, remarks on your reflection on what uh, you heard up to now in the presentation, but also on uh, the, the important uh, you know, reflection from uh, Dr. Nivin. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Peter. And I'm really inspiring, as I said earlier, to see this example from Egypt, uh, opening the conversation actually on this uh, most critical uh, topic at a very timely moment. Uh, and then really to uh, see the inspiring words coming from uh, Dr. Naveen, who's of course uh, an old colleague as well. Um, so, I mean, thank you also to the presenters, IPCIG and the bank. So I, I will focus my remarks uh, or my reflections, uh, Peter, around uh, two key areas in terms of the why on, uh, on, on social protection for populations on the move from a UNICEF perspective, and then the what, you know, in terms of some ideas, reflections on how it can actually be operationalized. As Dr. Naveen said, sometimes it's not an issue of good intention. It's not a lack of intentions, but, you know, modalities in which to operationalize those. So on the why, I think uh, there's uh, three, three major areas to, to focus on. And the first is actually Dr. Naveen started her remarks by focusing on the right to social protection. Uh, it's laid out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, for children. Uh, there's also the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where the right to social security is very clearly spelled out, and also in a host of other human rights instruments. And what is important to remember here in the case of children specifically also uh, is the fact that this applies to children, you know, this right is, 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 is fundamental to children in a certain country and not, you know, from a certain country, meaning that as duty bearers, States have the responsibility to help uh, um, um, uh, achieve uh, this fundamental uh, child right in the countries that the children find themselves in, regardless of migration status. Uh, and I think you know this has been made fairly clear in terms of uh, the, the presentation, but also uh, the earlier remarks. Uh, but what is also, uh, I think, uh, important to recall here is that this is reinforced by the focus of the SDGs on leaving no one behind. So actually, the commitment to having this right to uh, uh, social security, social protection, um, I think Egypt has you know, laid that out quite clearly, uh, is also reinforced by the commitment to achieve the SDGs, uh, and, and specifically SDG 1.3 on social protection and with a view to leave no one behind. But there's also, I think, in addition to uh, the normative case, this is my second point, is in terms of you know, the, the business case, in terms of why uh, you know, this, should, this, should, this should be uh, happening. And I think there's two broad points here. Uh, the first is actually migrants, refugees, populations, and families on the move are, you know, important contributors to societies and economies. As a global statistics, for example, a statistic, for example, uh, for those who are living outside their country of birth in, in total globally, they represent 3.4% of the global population, but they contribute to 9.4% of the global GDP. And I think you know, that statistic bears out uh, you know, the fact that migrants, refugees, and populations on the move, um, including in our region where you know, a large part of the workforce, uh, the, the, the economy, is actually in the informal economy, they're very much you know, significant contributors to economies and to societies. But secondly, I think in our region, and uh, Dr. Naveen also referred to it briefly, Peter, you spoke about it as well at one point, the fact that I think on social protection specifically, 
we've seen, especially I, I would say post, uh, you know, the, 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 the Syria crisis, situations where expanding access to social protection for refugees has actually helped strengthen national systems, uh, especially, as I said, in the Syria affected countries. When the Syria crisis began and the influx of refugees began to countries like Jordan, Lebanon, even Egypt, uh, and Turkey, of course, uh, you know, there were significant uh, gaps in terms of social protection coverage uh, for, for, for the refugees uh, coming from Syria. Uh, and UN agencies, um, along with, you know, uh, key partners such as the EU, uh, uh, the UK and so forth, uh, Germany stepped up support on social protection, expanding that coverage. And, and you see the effects of that, the positive effects of that in strengthening national systems. In Lebanon, for instance, Lebanon did not have a you know, national social cash transfer program. For the first time, this is being discussed. Uh, and one could argue that the foundations for that were laid by the social cash transfers, the humanitarian cash transfers uh, that were you know, uh, provided uh, to, to, to uh, you know, Syrian refugees, uh, to host communities uh, in, in, in countries like Lebanon, uh, in, in Lebanon specifically, but also in, in places like Jordan and, and of course, uh, Turkey. Uh, in Jordan and Turkey, we have the examples of how the operational modalities of, you know, strength of national social protection systems have actually improved, you know, learning from the experiences of providing uh, social protection uh, to refugees. So, I mean, I think there's a strong case to be made that enhancing shock responsive social protection, which is now, you know, a huge global and regional imperative, of course, especially post COVID benefits from experiences, has benefited from experiences of expanding social protection uh, to, to, to refugees and to populations in the move in general. My third point in terms of the context of the region in terms of why this needs to happen, uh, I, have, I have two quick points there. The first is actually post COVID, you know, I mean, the region has witnessed one of the worst economic crises we've seen in decades, perhaps, um, you know, compounded of course by the, the, the collapsed oil prices. Uh, and actually it is really heartening to see how countries such as Jordan, Iraq, Morocco, you know, when they implemented emergency national cash transfer social assistance responses, uh, this included in many cases, uh, populations such as, uh, you know, uh, migrants in particular, uh, the emergency cash assistance program in Jordan, the Minha program in, uh, in Iraq are actually very good examples of that and, and showcase that national governments increasingly recognize the importance of, of, of making this a reality. The second is that MENA, of course, is a region which is unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, witnessing a lot of conflicts and crises. Uh, we have in MENA alone 5.8 million refugee children and 6.8 million, uh, 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 you know, uh, IDP children uh, in in in, uh, in in terms of IDPs. So you're talking about almost, you know, 12 to 13 million uh, children on the move. And that is not a statistic that can, you know, that, that, that is not just a mere matter of statistic. It's we're talking about children, you know, having the rights to health, education, and, and, and in this case, social protection being realized or not. So it is a significant uh, number and, and, and a huge imperative in terms of being able to you know, help achieve that vision. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of how we go about uh, making this a reality, you know, turning that intention into, into, into practice, I think uh, a number of speakers already referred to the examples of learning from other sectors. I think that's something that we really need to do uh, on the social protection side. We've heard the stories, for example, in, 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 in Jordan, where I sit, for example, uh, uh, refugees also being, you know, uh, uh, receiving the COVID vaccines, uh, countries such as Jordan and Lebanon, uh, you know, doing double shift in terms of schools, accommodating uh, refugee children into the national education system with the strong support of development and humanitarian partners. And I think there are, you know, key lessons to be drawn there. On the social protection side, and, uh, you know, I, I will conclude by three points in terms of where I see, uh, you know, it's important to focus in terms of, you know, making this uh, uh, commitment to reality. Uh, the first is actually exploring systematically what are the policy options in terms of uh, integrating uh, refugees and migrants into uh, social protection uh, schemes and in, you know, expanding coverage, but also via national systems as and when possible. Um, this was I, I highlighted in the study, uh, in, the, in the presentation on the study, the legislation and policy aspect as one of the key enabling environments. Um, I would you know, suggest, uh, uh, Peter, for example, you know, in Egypt, 
uh, uh, Ministry of Social Solidarity is also leading the process of articulating a national social protection strategy. Actually, many countries in the region at the moment are doing that, especially in a post-COVID reality. And this is a huge opportunity uh, to, to reflect on this issue and to you know, see what is realistically possible. Where is it possible to start uh, this conversation? What policy options do exist? in terms of integrating these international policies, because you know, it has to start uh, uh, somewhere in that sense, in terms of the move towards national systems and integration and alignment. The second is uh, uh, looking programmatically uh, at modeling and generating the evidence in terms of what works, you know, just, just as we saw uh, on the example from Brazil on, on, on Venezuelan uh, refugees, um, you know, can we learn already from the, you know, already capture the lessons from existing examples in the region. In Turkey, for example, UNICEF uh, with EU support uh, does two programs, uh, the Emergency Social Safety Net Program and the Cond Conditional Cash Transfer uh, Program for Education, uh, which has various levels of alignment with the national social protection system, either in terms of what you call shadow alignment or even in terms of you know, piggybacking on the national uh, uh, social protection system to deliver these benefits. So how can we you know, take stock of this evidence, but you know, more importantly, where the opportunities exist, uh, do the modeling in terms of making something possible. Is it possible, for example, uh, to at least start registering uh, refugees into national social protection databases? I mean, what is the starting point? Each country will have its own specificity, but I think there's rich experiences in the region uh, that we can uh, capture and, you know, uh, and, and, and explore entry points uh, uh, based on country context, of course. And the third and final point for me uh, is also one that Dr. Naveen stressed very heavily, is the issue of financing, uh, is, is in terms of uh, how to ensure uh, the financing envelope for these interventions exist. Uh, you know, I mean, government uh, finances are stretched, especially post-COVID. Uh, what is the role that humanitarian and development partners have, therefore, in exploring a more innovative financing solutions? Is there a possibility, for example, of looking at longer term humanitarian financing windows rather than the usual yearly uh, option that you know or model that 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 currently dominates uh, and i know that you know there are a number of initiatives uh, and actors that are very much looking into this issue the eu you know the prospects partnership with the dutch government uh, and indeed unicef's own partnership in terms of uh, the, the blueprint partnership with the unhcr is looking at both you know the the modeling aspect and the financing. But I think you know, we also owe it to national governments as development partners, as humanitarian partners, to understand the financing uh, constraints that they face and, and working collaboratively in uh, exploring more innovative solutions there that can complement government finances to ensure that the right to social protection for migrants and refugees actually becomes a reality. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I'll end there and uh, back to you. Thanks, Amma. When you raised the quite a lot of, uh, of points. I mean, I want to highlight one of the first point in which you, you did you hinted, which is about the uh, often the uh, how refugees and migrants are presented as a cost and a burden rather than uh, uh, you know, a, an investment. They contribute to the economy, to the global economy, to the economy of a nation. So that's, I think that's an interesting uh, aspect that it needs always to be there, uh, the narrative on uh, on my, migrants and refugees, their contribution to the economy. Also, what you mentioned that uh, in quite a few countries, maybe it's not specifically the case of Egypt, but um, uh, definitely Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, the influx of refugees has triggered positive impacts into the national social protection system that was basically not existent before and is now taking shape. And it's taking shape in a way that it's already inclusive because that's what triggered it was triggered by influx of non-national uh, in a country and also um, you referenced uh, you know if, if we consider an influx of refugees as a shock uh, the, the, a shock responsive uh, a shock response was also what triggered this now um, I have a, we're having some questions and I'm going to ask you the first question as you already uh, uh, connected here. Um, so in, in relation to COVID, how do you see that the COVID, uh, or do you see that the COVID uh, crisis can, uh, to some extent, have and trigger um, uh, uh, you know, the development of more inclusive social protection systems, as it did in some countries, this influx of refugees? 
And if you if you also have time, you mentioned about the role of the UN. We discussed this also in the past about development partners. Uh, is it only about financing, um, or do you see uh, a different role for development partners? And if I can ask you to be as brief <laughs> as possible. Thanks. Sure. Uh, no, thanks, Peter. I mean, on your first question, absolutely. I think COVID is a crisis, a huge crisis, but also a great opportunity. And uh, let us not forget that social protection is has been the key instrument uh, responding to the socioeconomic, the significant socioeconomic response uh, impacts of, of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, indeed, countries across the region are taking this uh, crisis as also a, a moment uh, of opportunity to reform. Uh, national social protection systems, including in the Gulf, for example, uh, you know, significant reforms being planned uh, in, in Iraq, in Jordan, I know in Egypt as well, but also in the North African countries and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, this can definitely, uh, you know, looking at the fact that in their national emergency responses, countries, as I said, uh, you know, found that, you know, those who were most affected by the COVID crisis socioeconomically were the daily wage workers. Right in in most countries across the region where the informal economies are significant, uh, and and you are talking about you know uh, you know uh, the, you know uh, families, uh, uh, migrant families, refugee families being you know a significant proportion of that, and this is definitely you know entered into the consciousness of of governments undertaking these policy reforms, and I think you know I, I and I, I think and I hope that you know, this will be a key plank of, of, of the reforms that are being planned in terms of both coverage, but also delivery modalities as we've seen in a few countries. On your second question, in terms of the role of humanitarian and development partners, um, um, I think financing is a key plank. It's not the only one. I think you know, uh, partners have a, a critical role to, to, to play in terms of you know, uh, leveraging global evidence, in terms of advocacy, in terms of coordination as well. Um, and in terms of jointly exploring, you know, where as and when needed support uh, to delivery and operational modality. So, you know, those are the broad categories. Uh, my reference to financing was, you know, a, a reflection also more on the fact that governments see that as a huge constraint. But, you know, I think we, we also owe it to our national counterparts to be better coordinated ourselves in terms of, you know, bringing the best technical expertise and the best advice uh, to the table. Uh, and also advocating in cases where there needs to be advocacy, uh, advocacy to you know make improvements in the systems and coverage and so forth. Over. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Very clear, very, very good uh, um, to 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 you know for for, for further reflection. So um, now uh, we we are seeing a couple of questions. I mean, uh, I wanted to ask the next question to Dr. Nivin, and uh, uh, again here. We are interested also in your perspective as a practitioner, you know, obviously, again, minister here in Egypt, but also practitioner knowing uh, the, the region. Um, now, it is clear that there is uh, the intention. I mean, there is this, uh, uh, and even in Egypt, there is a, a clear uh, or a nascent, let's say, a nascent legal framework that shows that there is this intention of, of being as inclusive as possible, not just in social protection, uh, but also in, in other areas. And we, we've seen it in the, uh, when we talk about education and health. Now, what do you think are the top two or three challenges that the government have to really transform this intention, to transform this uh, initial legal basis that is being produced into something concrete? Um, I don't want to suggest any answer, but uh, I, I, I feel that often uh, um, these uh, um, struggling or, or prioritizing um, beneficiaries, so the, the nationals versus the non-national, is often a key concern at political level and also as, implica as political implications. So this, this might be also a, a top uh, issue that um, governments do consider when uh, trying to transform these intentions into practice. Um, do you have um, any reflections on this? So the, the main challenges that you feel are, uh, uh, are that for countries in, in this region and in, in Egypt as well? Uh, you, you're muted, Dr. Nguyen. 
uh, let me tell you that uh, I think social investment is becoming a challenge with the increasing demand. It's not only uh, in terms of financial resources, but in terms of uh, uh, policy priorities. Um, I think um, the main challenge is, uh, I, I still claim that it is the, one of the biggest uh, challenges is the information, is that you cannot really um, assess how much cost and how much effort you're going to invest. And um, I think having a unified database, and it's very difficult to have this within an informal issue because the, we face the same issue for casual workers and irregular workers. So the issue is that it's scattered, it's uh, unorganized, uh, it's uh, not disaggregated in, in a scientific manner. You can say it's uh, 2 million, you can say it's 5 million. So you cannot have real study uh, and uh, assessment of the situation. So I think number one is to 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 start. I, I don't. I, I'm not aiming to have it to have this ended in a short period of time, but at least to start have something formalized in terms of a unified database and electronic networks between us as government partners and between us and international partners to have this issue at least contained and well understood. The second issue is that to, to specify or to allocate resources, um, not only from international organizations, but from the government itself. I think, uh, and this is what we're trying to do, and we were just thinking of it in having it amended into the uh, social pension law, is that how much can we uh, put the refugees? And we were, we were faced with uh, many questions on, if you put it, do you have a, an exact number or do you have a limit for the numbers? Supposedly you have millions and millions. So what are you going to do towards this if you have it yourself committed legally to cover them with social pension as well? So the issue is that you're between uh, uh, financial insufficiency and unclarity of data. Uh, I think also there's a big problem of awareness. Um, uh, you know that uh, we have apart from the center that we developed on trafficking, on, you know, on protection of, of human rights and protection of people from trafficking. We have other aid centers that are hosting violated women and women at the risk of being violated. They don't accept refugees, but they also don't accept people with disabilities. So it's a matter of, so I told them, yeah, this is a sort of, you're discriminating against specific categories of people you have to be as broad and as inclusive as possible so i think there's a misperception of refugees is that they flee they flee the, the, out of their countries because their countries did not protect them so they are coming to here to take our rights and this affects our also our benefits so the issue is that there's a problem of awareness when you explain that they are being victims sometimes they are being victims rather than being just being to take part of your right. Uh, so I think there's a big problem of awareness and of human rights culture uh, towards this category of people. I think also uh, the, the, the refugees and the asylum seekers themselves need to, to equip themselves with some skills and with other uh, traits that help them to adapt into the Egyptian communities. They come and then they separate themselves in ghettos uh, in, uh, and they have close communities amongst themselves. Although the moment they start to open up and get integrated with the Egyptian community, uh, I mean, both sides have issues uh, in, in, in developing this, is that uh, there's a problem of integration. When we say reintegration, they are not integrated basically. So it's not a reintegration, it's an issue of having a harmonized source of relations to learn a bit more of, it's not only the language, uh, and sometimes if the religion is totally different, it's not because in Egypt we have uh, Islam and Christianity, which are the biggest. So supposedly the refugees are coming from Africa with different religion, so they don't keep uh, cope that much. But I actually praise the, the religious institutions uh, that actually pay special attention for refugees and they cover them with social protection measures but uh, maybe we did not mention them in our speech, but I think they have a big role to play in Egypt, whether Al-Azhar or the, um, the church, 
because many of the uh, religious institutions they cover uh, actually and the jamia sharia they cover refugees with but they are unseen and and eventually they, it's not calculated so i think these are the main four issues that we need uh, pass on the government and and pass on uh, uh, the refugees themselves and pass on the public opinion and more awareness uh, and i think also the uh, the data maybe we need to de to develop a legal framework but not a legal framework by itself but a legal framework within a broader vision of uh, the different core issues or the different uh, um, pillars that we need to work on and not to have a le legal framework uh, i mean jumping by itself which will either be applied but within with no human eye uh, and uh, or not to be applied uh, at all so i think um, we need to be close to each other and to work even more and more uh, on on this issue and i i actually claim that within the issue of the refugees uh, some of the categories are being discriminated against more and more and or not discriminated but they are living in hardships like the refugees with disabilities the women refugees especially those who are subject to rapes and to so on and they are not seen as victims as much as they are seen that they are perpetrators thank you very much thank you thank you i think you raised the one point which we we didn't really discuss which is uh, uh, is not only about uh, governments to create um, a framework for integration is also a, a proactive role of refugees and migrants to, 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 to take steps towards um, exiting you know, this, this bubble that often they create. It's like the safety net as well, and to, to be proactive in trying to uh, connect with, uh, uh, not necessarily with Egypt, I mean, if you're in Egypt, of course, but also with, with, the, with the local, with the host um, communities. Um, so thank you very much for, for, these, uh, for these points. I think we are only have time for another question. I think, uh, what, let, let me ask this question. It's something that uh, you, you, it's clearly it's really interesting to me, which is uh, the narrative. It's the, how uh, the, the, the debate, the political debate, the, the debate in the society um, affects uh, uh, social protection systems and in, in, in more inclusive social protection system and not only social protection system but more uh, open policies towards non-nationals. Uh, someone mentioned about costs and investments. Um, often there is this struggle between uh, who we need to prioritize um, in a country and I wanted, I'm very interested about the example uh, of Brazil. So. I'm going to give a, a couple of minutes to the IPC team. I don't know if Rafael or Marina will, will be uh, answering. And then also to um, uh, Marika in case she, she has any comments. So uh, to what extent this the narrative, how non-national, so non-Brazilian uh, are, are presented, are, um, are narrated uh, in, the, in the society in Brazil, uh, has an impact on uh, uh, the Brazilian social protection and the inclusiveness of the Brazilian social protection systems and beyond. Um, um, thanks, Peter. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, Marina, please. Um, yeah, no, sorry about the background noise here, but um, I think um, Ritika and Rovan may be, may be more uh, able to, to answer the question because they looked into the case of Brazil more closely. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we, we covered the, the perception in Brazil of, of, of the migration movements and things like that. Maybe they could um, chip in or maybe Rafael yeah. wants to answer. I think Rafael, you wanted to say something as well, right? And then... Uh, um... uh, yes. to stress this point about uh, the problem of awareness, the problem of how society view migrants, because, uh, for instance, this has been a, this is a big issue everywhere. Uh, how do you pronounce, how do you pronounce this in English? It's xenophobia. Yes, is that right? Huh? Xenophobia, fears of foreigners. 
So this is this is very this is a very common trait in all societies, and this is really really an issue. So in Brazil, uh, we have very this very distinct situation. For instance, for the migrants that come from Venezuela, and the ones that come from Bolivia, because uh, as we have this humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, there was the need to respond to that, because for instance there were huge conflicts in the cities of the border because suddenly they were flooded by Venezuelans and the population grew and the social assistance and health and education services uh, in these municipalities already had difficulties providing for the nationals. So they see it as a competition and it is competition for scarce resources. So this is really an issue that should be thought of uh, when we are thinking about building more inclusive social protection systems is not just the legal frameworks, uh, is not just what we are going to do in terms of, of public policy, but also this issue of how to create awareness, uh, explain the situation of the migrants, and deal with this very serious issue that sometimes uh, what you need to provide for the migrants, so you're not providing for your nation also. This is a very serious political issue. This produces a lot of conflicts in society, and this is a dimension that cannot be overseen. But this is all I wanted to say. Over to you. Thanks, Rafael. Thank you. Uh, let me see if uh, um, the Wobine team would like to make some uh, points on this. I don't know if Aven or Marika. Hi, Luigi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting us to join this. So just a few words on that. I think uh, what we noticed from the Brazil case that despite that the few legal barriers, we still have an issue on integration. So we were not able to actually uh, measure and it was not part of the study, uh, the xenophobia, the, uh, but or even understand the impact of the, all the language barriers that they face here. Uh, but uh, like Rafael just said, it's a humanitarian crisis. But despite of being a humanitarian crisis, uh, we as a host country um, here found that it's hard to, you don't have to see them as a, you, you have to accommodate. So you develop this uh, Operation Welcome, which is uh, UNHCR is a partner with the government and other organizations to receive this group. But also you have to make this into an opportunity for inclusion and make them part of and integrate into societies and try to find way of uh, staying here and do human capital investments in on the host communities and take these into this humanitarian crisis to a development challenges that we need to face on integrating this group, which is towards what our study was trying to measure and understand uh, how to not uh, take them as temporary host, but make it these policies more inclusive and integrate them into the labor market and being part of the community where they are living in now and not uh, maintain them in shelters, right? So think job placements and economic inclusion, integration. Um, it's a uh, key uh, policies that we have to evolve for this group. I think there is plenty of uh, evidence that with a little bit of uh, support, they can try and there is medium term, uh, and in the medium term, you just notice multiplier effects on of the diversification and inclusion of these uh, foreigners into society. So, so I think, uh, but it's not an easy, right, uh, to be inclusive. It's something that we have to be always measure and try to build evidence to make sure uh, your uh, the, the policies are inclusive. Even like the case of Brazil, how we notice on the on this study, right? Even if you don't have uh, legal barriers, there is other contexts that complicate integration of migrants or forced displacement groups in 
into society, into communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. I don't know if, uh, um, Mritika, you have any points you want to add or? No, I think. Uh... All right, I think we reached already. It's, uh, we are three minutes past one. I want to thank everybody, um, just for everybody to know that we'll be sharing the links to um, the recordings, uh, we'll be sharing the presentation, the report. It's already online on the IPC website. We also release soon a uh, um, report highlights that summarizes the key uh, findings and uh, elements that we, we have been discussing uh, today. Um, again, thanks to everybody. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nivin, to for being with us for these two hours. Uh, thank you. Pleasure. IPC, uh, thank you to the IPC team, uh, uh, Rafael, Marina, Maya, Lucas, the World Bank team, Mitika and Oven, Samman from our regional office, and all the other colleagues that have uh, made this possible. And thanks to all the attendees um, to uh, participate in the discussion. Have a, have a good Thursday and Ramadan Karim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.